2022 was easily one of my favorite years in gaming in a good long while. It brought so many amazing games that it was almost unreal the selection we had. And I really wanted to talk about some of my favorites. So sit back and relax as I tell you my top 10 games of this year. Since this is going to be something we will be doing year after year, I wanted to lay a few ground rules here and now. No remasters allowed. So something like Crisis Core Union will not be allowed onto the list. However, games like Final Fantasy VII Remake that completely change up the formula will be allowed on this list if they were released and were good. That's pretty much it. Let's begin. You know, while making this list, I kept thinking back on the release of this game and how I thought that it was just going to be another Nick All-Stars Brawl situation. The kind of game that's hyped up as a smash killer is going to make Nintendo really have to bring the next level of gaming, yada yada yada, and then just kind of fizzle out and die as sort of a forgotten memory. But when it was released, it completely exceeded every expectation I had for it. The 2v2 focus on the gameplay was a surprise smash hit for me. Made the gameplay so much fun to play with a friend as you watched each other's backs in online play. And if you weren't a fan of that, no worries. Things like 1v1s and free-for-alls were completely choosable. And I do have to admit, while the game does have its rough spots, it's still without a doubt one of the best multiplayer games this year. Speaking of multiplayers... Okay, so I think if we're all being totally honest, the TMNT have not exactly been at their A game with their video games these past few years. Like, nothing that's been exactly a giant garbage fest of hate-filled proportions, but they've never really been able to reach the heights of something like the SNES Turtles in Time game. But, I personally believe, all of that has changed with the release of Shredder's Revenge. Instead of trying to push the Turtles into another 3D-style game that could end up either clunky or great, Shredder's Revenge brings the heroes in a half-shell back to the days of the 2D four-player beat-em-up, except this time, you and six of your friends can battle your way through the story mode together. They're accompanied by an incredibly well-polished gameplay fighting system that feels both easy to learn and incredible to master. And it even comes with two new playable characters in the forms of April O'Neil and Master Splinter. While I do think the game suffers from having no crossplay whatsoever, it is a masterful multiplayer experience that deserves far more love. Alright, so it's not much of a stretch to say that Sonic and the 3D genre have, well, they haven't really been on the best terms. While some games were amazing, like Generations and the Adventure games, most of the times the 3D games are either divisive or straight up hated. Which is why I'm so happy to say that Sonic Frontiers is one of the best Sonic experiences I've ever played. The open zone gameplay fits perfectly with the fast-moving gameplay of a Sonic game. The character interactions are incredibly fun and engaging, like Sonic and Knuckles' friendly rivalry, or Eggman and Sage's father-daughter relationship. Frontiers also has some of the most hype-as-hell boss fights I've seen not only in the Sonic series, but in the past, like, 20 years of 3D gaming tops, accompanied by a killer soundtrack to give them even more intensity. While the game isn't perfect by any means, it really shows a bright step forward for the Sonic franchise, and one I am more than happy to join the ride for. <music> to be honest, I'm not usually a big fan of the roguelike genre. I don't hate it, I'm just usually the kind of guy who picks up a JRPG before picking up a roguelike. But good god, was Sifu the game that nearly made it one of my favorite? favorite genres. This game had some of the best hand-to-hand -hand combat I've played in years, with a deep level of challenge that rewards you for mastering it to beat down the waves of enemies thrown at you. The game really excels at making you feel like a martial arts master from a kung fu movie as you run through levels whooping asses left and right. Adding to this is how consistently dying will age up your character, which both helps and hurts you at the same time, a mechanic that I hope more roguelikes try out someday. While the difficulty may be a bit brutal for some and the checkpoint system could use a little bit of work, 
if you can overcome those hurdles, you get to play probably what might be one of the best action games this year. You know, during these past five to six years I've had a Switch, whenever I stop and think about all the games on there, I come to this realization that a lot of the best ones are the ones that came out of their comfort zone to experiment with their IPs. Mario and Rabbit, Breath of the Wild, Pokemon Legends Arceus, and Kirby in the Forgotten Land is most definitely one of them. Instead of the usual side-scrolling format that pretty much every Kirby game has used before, Forgotten Land chooses to go for a 3D style of level design and gameplay similar to Super Mario 3D World. This allows for all new ways to explore levels, find collectibles, and battle enemies. Alongside the new level design is the new ability Mouthful Mode that basically lets you turn Kirby into a car. It's a game that's as adorable to look at as it is fun to play. Plus, you can give Kirby a gun. And uh, let's just say that's an instant game seller for me. Sexy, stylish, and ooh, so satisfying. Bayonetta 3 delivered in every aspect I needed for its third installment. While the gameplay, voice acting, and characterization was damn near top notch, whether you were weapon swapping as Bayonetta to sexily slice up enemies, or side scrolling as Secret Agent John, or maybe you preferred to slice and dice as Viola, what really won me over was just how different it felt to the other Bayonetta games, given the darker direction the story took. It was an incredibly interesting experience to play through a Bayonetta game where Bayonetta herself is up against someone who feels like far more than she can handle. It does have some faults, certainly, but it is easily one of, if not the best action game this entire year, and a definite must play for any Switch owner. An all new turn-based strategy IP from Square Enix that also uses the same kind of 2D HD art style as Octopath Traveler? <laughs> Shut up and take my money! Seriously though, Triangle Strategy was one hell of an incredibly well put together game. It does a fantastic job of portraying real world human desires and the brutal horror of war itself through its playthroughs. The gameplay and animations for attacks were some of the best I've seen this year, especially coming from a 2D sprite game. But the honest best part of this game for me was the voting system which actually could change the entire flow of the story. It encouraged replayability in a way I haven't seen a lot of turn-based strategy games do before. It's a damn shame this game didn't get pushed more than it did, as it easily one of Square's, if not Square's, best game this entire year. I was a pretty big fan of God of War 2018. So, when I heard about Ragnarok getting released, you can tell I was very excited to play it. And once I did, it made me immensely happy to see Santa Monica Studios did not disappoint with their sequel. Almost every single aspect of this game was a complete improvement over the first. The characters feel so much more fleshed out than the first one. The world is far more expressive with the ability to travel to basically any realm you want leading to more levels and side quests and boss fights. Thor and Odin has so much more of a presence and weight than Balder did, and Balder was an awesome villain, don't get me wrong. But these two were just, just mwah. And the combat feels much more fluid, no matter who you're playing as. The only problem for me is that I wish they would just stop talking every 10 seconds. If they did, this would have been higher. This might have even been my number two game this year. But that goes to something else. Transitioning a series with an established formula can either make or break a franchise entirely. While there are games like Breath of the Wild and Mario 64, which were both critical and commercial successes, there was also Mega Man X7, which is Mega Man X7. So it's amazing to see FromSoft bring the Souls formula to an open world setting in a near flawless fashion. The game does so many things right, from its beautiful, dark, and yet broken world, to the 
fluid combat that feels like a perfect balance between the original Souls games and the new styles of gameplay like Sekiro and Bloodborne. And it weaves a world and narrative that's incredibly satisfying to explore and learn. The game does have a couple flaws, but it's a game I can easily say is one of the best games of this generation. But it is not my favorite game of this year. That goes to something else. I never once thought to myself that a series I got into recently would ever become my game of the year. But lo and behold, Xenoblade Chronicles 3 showed up on my doorstep when I pre-ordered it and proved to me how wrong that statement was. Everything about this game is a knock out of the park to me. The world is beautiful and fun to explore. So many side quests give a great look into the heroes that join you. The combat is incredibly smooth addicting and just fun to play through. The characters are complex with deep and meaningful backstories that make you feel for them and all the struggles they've been through. And the story genuinely got me to shed a tear. Everything about this game just clicks with me as not only a fan of this franchise, but a fan of JRPGs in general. And it makes me even more excited to see what this series brings to the table with its next installments. And that's why I believe it's definitely worth my choice for my top game of 2022. And with that out of the way, I think we can consider this list finished. Thank you all so much for joining me on this. If you like this, make sure to like and subscribe. And if there are any games I missed that you think should have been on here, let me know in the comments. I wasn't able to play everything this year, so there are definitely things I missed. I would love to know what your favorite game of this year was, though, so let me know in the comments. Good night, everybody, and have a pleasant tomorrow, and have a hopefully wonderful 2023.